Okay, looks like we are live. Uh, hopefully, everybody can hear me. Hopefully, uh, we are uh, moving along. It's a little tough sometimes to see uh, how things are working because of the way that the streaming connection sometimes it's a bit slow but it looks like we're moving hopefully and we'll be able to get uh, our uh, chat in uh, our study in today uh, and so I see that someone sees me and hears me and so that's important hopefully that's the way it'll stay so let me begin uh, tonight uh, well first of all let me say that I was uh, mentioning last week that we were going to try to do maybe some Google Hangouts this week so that we could uh, look at each other and so on and so forth but the problem is that there's some folks that were unable to get their um, apps set up and so it would have been difficult for them to get on not to mention that sometimes with those um, streams, when there's a lot of people in the same stream, those things get a little difficult to control, as it were. And um, we don't want to miss the study. So what I think what I'll do is see if we can have maybe something like what the ladies are doing, a sort of um, fellowship, and that way we can test it out see how it works and if some folks can't connect or, or so on at least they won't miss any of the study that way uh, and so hopefully um, we can do that but let me begin by reading something from uh, this little book that let's see it's called the imitation of christ by uh, thomas akempis and i've mentioned him before on wednesday night and i've talked about how he is an individual who was considered a mystic in the Middle Ages. He lived in the 14th century. Uh, and so the book is good, definitely. has a lot of good things in it. But it also has a number of things in it that, well, you have to use some discernment. And so you have to be careful when you use uh, books of this nature because they can be... Um, uh, they have some things in them that are not that great, but for the most part, the book is very good. And so let me read a, a little thing for you tonight that hopefully will make a very important point. Uh, oh, Lord, I shall suffer willingly for your sake, whatever you wish to send me. I'm ready to accept from your hand both good and evil alike, the sweet and the bitter together, sorrow with joy. And for all that happens to me, I am grateful. Keep me from all sin and I will fear neither death nor hell. Do not cast me out forever, nor blot me out of the book of life, and whatever tribulation befalls will not harm me. So uh, I think that in the current environment especially, it is important for us as Christians to uh, understand the reality that the Lord is the one that determines uh, our future. He determines everything about us, and accordingly, we uh, we have to accept whatever comes from his hand and we have to be grateful for whatever things take place in our lives and so it's important for us to uh, to understand that and to act accordingly um, i have one question uh, remember that i sent out an email about if you had any questions since this is technically uh, the second wednesday where we have um, questions and answers but only one person uh, answered me uh, sent me questions which uh, are uh, concerning supralepsarianism and infralepsarianism and I know uh, some of you may not have heard those terms before uh, I had never heard them until I came to to grace and so uh, don't be surprised if you haven't heard of them uh, because they're not terms that are bandied about all that often and it's simply because they're uh, rather complicated 
And so let me give you, uh, in a nutshell, more or less the definition of what they're supposed to mean. Supralapsarianism is basically the idea that in the order, the logical order of God's decrees, the uh, decree of uh, the fall uh, followed the decree of who the Lord was going to save. Uh, and so, uh, in other words, he, the Lord decreed, I'm going to save uh, Alan, for example. And after he said, he decreed that, then he decreed that there would be a fall. Okay, that would be sort of like the, um, a, the concept that emphasizes God's sovereignty above anything else. Then, um, infralepsarianism is sort of like the other way around. The God decreed first there would be a fall, and then he decreed who he would save. So first he decrees there will be a fall, then he decrees I'm going to save Alan. And so that's the difference between the two. Um, obviously, it's something that the Bible does not speak to. And so, to be honest with you, I don't know why theologians have bothered with that. But, uh, you know, the, the idea came, uh, especially during the Reformation, about how God decreed what he decreed when it comes to salvation. And so, as far as I'm concerned, you know, Again, the Bible does not speak to that. To me, it seems that logically, the Lord would have uh, decreed a fall and then decreed who he was going to save. Um, but, again, how he did it is for him to know. It is a secret thing. It is not, uh, you know, he obviously has not revealed it to us. And obviously because he doesn't think that it's necessary for us to know. And so according, uh, accordingly, I'm not going to speculate into what's right and what's wrong. Uh, you know, either side makes uh, the case for their side. Uh, they make some cogent arguments about it. Uh, but again, it's not something that I'm, um, I'm going to delve into because it really isn't uh, important in my estimation. Uh, so that being uh, out of the way since that was the only question that I got uh, I thought about uh, you know I've been reading in Ezekiel and Ezekiel is uh, one of the prophets of the captivity he was one of the folks that was uh, taken captive by Babylon and he prophesied during the Babylonian captivity or at least part of it and so I got to chapter 16 and chapter 16 a very long chapter has over 60 verses uh, but there the Lord is talking, and here's uh, how the New American Standard Bible, the um, caption, the heading for the chapter is God's grace to unfaithful Jerusalem, or to unfaithful Judah. Uh, and I thought uh, that that is a very good um, heading, a good, very good caption. Obviously those captions, those headings are not uh, inspired. They were put there by probably the translator in this case. But uh, in this case, I think that it really uh, encapsulates what this chapter is all about. Uh, because that is really the idea. Uh, and so, for example, verses 1 to 14, and let's go through this a little bit. I'm not going to read it all because obviously, as I mentioned, it's a very long chapter. And if I, was, uh, I were to read it, then we'd be just basically spending the night just reading. And so, um, the um, verses 1 to 14, the Lord uh, speaks about rescuing an unworthy people. And really, when you think about Ezekiel 16, it is a very, uh, a parallel, uh, for lack of a better term, of the salvation uh, in the New Testament, really, when you think about it. Because you, you're looking about the fact that God is saving an unworthy people. He talks about how he found Israel. And he uses the imagery, a very um, graphic imagery, when he says that um, he rescued Israel. He found Israel in its blood, basically, like a baby, like a newborn baby who was still in the blood. Uh, but yet... He rescued Israel, he cleansed them, he gave them life, he says in verse 6. Uh, he made them numerous, 
in verse 7 remember uh, the promise that he made to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12 where he said that he was going to bless the nations uh, there were a number of times when God made the promise to Abraham about the fact that um, he was going to make them more numerous than the sands on the seashore and so um, very interesting uh, an important aspect there. Um, he uh, covered their nakedness, the Lord said in verse 8. Uh, and then he goes on to speak about the purifications of marriage. He says that he bathed them, he anointed, anointed them, and he clothed them in verses 9 and 10. Uh, and he adorned them in verses 11 to 13. And you know how even today uh, in our own society, uh, ladies who are brides who are going to get married, uh, what do they do? They they get gussied up, so to speak, right? They get pretty. Uh, maybe they have pedicures and, and manicures and, and all this other kind of thing. And sometimes they wear something special for the wedding, like maybe it's a ring that uh, their grandmother gave them uh, or, or a necklace or something to that effect. Uh, in the Middle East, especially at the time that Ezekiel is writing, um, they did this even more so. You know, they adorned themselves very uh, glamorously, very obviously. And so the Lord here is using that imagery uh, to say not that they adorned themselves, but that the Lord himself adorned them. And so uh, it's a beautiful imagery of how the Lord um, was taking care of his people. Uh, as his bride then from verses 15 to 22 uh, what happened Israel rebelled uh, we obviously know that the history of Israel is basically one of rebellion if you look at the book of Judges what is the refrain there uh, Israel sins uh, they cry out to the Lord the Lord forgives them the Lord sends judges to to judge them and to deliver them from whether it's the Philistines or some of the other individuals, uh, the other nations that they had fallen prey to. Um, and then what happens? They rebel again. And at the end of the book, we have this uh, very sad um, verse that talks about how in those days there were no king in Israel. Everyone did what was good in their own sights. There's even uh, a verse that talks about how they fear the Lord and serve their own gods. And so think about the dichotomy there, the cognizant uh, dissonance, the cognizant dissonance that, that they had and that they fear the Lord. And yet, what do they do? They, uh, they worship other gods. And we will see here in this chapter of Ezekiel something very similar as we go along. So they rebel. Uh, in verse 15, what happens? They trust in themselves. And again, you can extrapolate that to our current situation today. Uh, even within the church, a lot of Christians, what do they do? They trust in themselves. They trust in the fact that they're smarter than other people, that uh, they are um, more sensitive than other people. You know, Arminianism, unfortunately, is very um, uh, placing trust in self. What can I do? Uh, I need to have faith. I need to. Uh, I need to do this. I need to do the other, uh, and it all comes from me. It's self-motivated, rather than coming from God, as the Scripture determines. You know, the Scripture talks about uh, in Second Timothy two, for example, about how it, it is the Lord that grants repentance unto salvation. Uh, in Ephesians two, it talks about how the Lord gives us faith. We are not saved from ourselves. And so when you begin to trust in yourself, that's a problem. And I'm not saying that everybody who is a Christian and is an Armenian uh, is trusting in themselves uh, to save themselves necessarily. But it is a dangerous thing. Uh, and so we need to be cognizant of that fact and ensure that we're not falling into that trap. Uh, in verses 16 and 17, uh, the Lord says that they played the harlot. Uh, and so... Uh, in the Old Testament, especially, there's a lot of um, instances where the unfaithfulness of the people is spoken of 
as uh, being harlotry. In other words, God is the husband, uh, his people Israel are the bride, and yet they have become harlots. They have gone adulterating with other gods. And so here Ezekiel is using that same imagery to talk about the unfaithfulness of Israel against the Lord. Look what the Lord has uh, gave them and offer it, uh, and then they turn around and offer it to idols. And it, verses 18 and 19. And I will read those because I found that so poignant and so interesting. Uh, it says there, uh, Then you took your embroidered cloth and cover them, and offer my oil and my incense before them. Also my bread, which I gave you, fine flour, oil and honey, with which I fed you, you would other offer before them for a soothing aroma, so it happened, declares the Lord God. And so what the Lord is saying there is, I gave you all these blessings, I gave you oil, I anointed you, I gave you bread to eat, and what do, you, what do you do with all these things instead of giving me thanks, instead of serving me uh, more fervently? You took them and you offered them to your idols. Uh, and when you think about that, that's really ironic. That not only were they being unfaithful, but they were using the very blessings that God was giving them. And turning around and offering them to their idols. That's sort of like adding insult to injury. For us today... Um, we can do the same things. We can be blessed by God abundantly, uh, physically, spiritually, uh, and in every way. And yet, we can become like the Israelites who, uh, and we can go about using our blessings not to serve God, but to serve ourselves, to make ourselves happy, to make ourselves more comfortable, uh, rather than doing the things that God wants us to do with all of those blessings that He bestows upon us. Uh, they took... And sacrifice uh, their children in verses 20 and 21. Uh, so again, uh, for today, what is uh, God sacrificing, or, or rather uh, the idea of sacrificing your children, is abortion. You know, that is the modern day worship of Moloch, as it were, where people will offer their children at the altar of convenience. You know, it's not convenient for them to be, uh, to have a child now. And so what happens? They offer their child uh, in abortion. Uh, and so that's what happening, what's happening today, and that's what was happening at that time. And not only did they play the harlot, not only did they go adulterating, but they did it with many nations. Uh, the Lord says from verses 22 to 29, uh, the Lord speaks about Egypt. He speaks about Assyria. He speaks about the Chaldeans. Uh, and so they went uh, and became idolaters with the gods of all of those nations. They made leagues with all of those nations. Of course, it didn't um, do them any good because eventually what happened? We know that Assyria conquered Samaria and uh, the Chaldeans, which are the Babylonians, conquered Judea. And so when you go, uh, you know, you make a pact with the devil and what happens? Eventually he's going to eat you up. It's sort of like the idea of uh, feeding the, the crocodile in hopes that he'll eat you last. But guess what? He's going to eat you nonetheless. And so to do that is a fool's errand uh, indeed. So then verses 35 to 59, the Lord talks about avenging himself. Uh, verses 38 to 43 they will be judged. Um, and and uh, bear in mind that Ezekiel is saying this at the beginning of the Babylonian uh, incursion into Israel. Remember that there were three separate times when the Babylonians came and took people captive. And they were pretty much separated by 10 years. Uh, it began in 606 and it ended in 586 when finally the, uh, the last of the captives were taken to um, Babylon and when uh, the whole city of Jerusalem was finally destroyed. And so he is uh, foreseeing these things. He is prophesying about these things. He is telling them that they are going to, um, if they think that they are being judged now, they should wait and see what's going to happen because it's going to be much worse. And indeed it was much worse. Uh, Babylon came and raised uh, not only the temple, but also the city 
uh, and took many more captives uh, to uh, Babylon. Uh, they were going to be worse off than Sodom and Samaria, the Lord says. We're, you remember Sodom and Gomorrah in uh, Genesis chapters 18 and 19, the, that uh, narrative about how they were punished because of their sinfulness. Later on in the same book, in the book of Ezekiel, in chapter 38, he'll speak about that very uh, issue of uh, Sodom and Gomorrah and, and what they did. Uh, and so um, they're going to be worse off than that. Uh, the punishment that they're going to receive is worse. Obviously, Sodom was not part of the people of God. And so they, uh, in a way, they didn't know better. Obviously, they did but they did not have the oracles of God like Israel did. And because they had the oracles of God, they were punished more severely. Amos chapter 3 verse 2 says, You among all nations have I chosen. Therefore I will punish you for your iniquities. And so the idea is that I have given you my word, I have given you my statues, and yet you chose to defy me, you chose to uh, be unfaithful to me. And because of that, you're going to be punished more severely. Um, let me read something from, uh, for you from um, Albert Barnes uh, concerning verse 44. Uh, <clears throat> and verse 44 says, uh, Behold, everyone that uses Proverbs shall use this proverb against you, saying, As it is the mother, so is her daughter. Uh, and Barnes says, The Jews prided themselves on being under the special protection of Jehovah. In the downfall of their neighbors, they found only additional grounds for confidence in their own security. Ezekiel now is severe rebuke, places in severe rebuke, places them on an equality with Sodom and Samaria. Alike have been their sins, except that Judah has had the preeminence in guilt. Alike shall be their punishments. And so we see there how... Uh, their punishment will be meet and will not, they will not be spared. And we know from history that indeed that is what took place. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar sent his um, troops and he did what he did uh, again by raising the city. So, in conclusion, in verses 60 to 63, um, however, even after all this bad news, after all these things that took place, uh, the unfaithfulness of Israel, the fact that they're going to be punished, and so on. What happens? Uh, the Lord remembers His covenant. The Lord is not, uh, does not remain angry forever. Uh, as uh, verse uh, or Psalm 121 talks about that very thing. Uh, the psalm is asked, you know, Lord, will you be angry forever? And the uh, answer is, you know, it's a rhetorical question that demands the answer of no. He will not remain angry forever. And so even in the midst of all this idolatry, of all this disobedience, the Lord remembers His covenant. And He says in verses 60 and, to 60 and 62, the Lord establishes an everlasting covenant. Uh, he's not going to be untrue to His word, even if we are untrue to ours. Um, in um, 2 Timothy 2 and 15, uh, or 2, 11 to 13 rather, Paul talks about how uh, even if we become unfaithful, the Lord remains faithful. Uh, that His faithfulness does not depend on ours. Uh, he is faithful to His word. He will fulfill His promises. Uh, and in verses 61 and 63, uh, it says that the people are going to be ashamed. Let me read those verses as we conclude here because I think that they're so important then you will remember your ways and be ashamed when you receive your sisters both your older and your younger and i will give them to you as daughters but not because of your covenant and then verse 63 in order that you may remember and be ashamed and never open your mouth anymore because of your humiliation when i have forgiven you for all that you have done the lord god declares isn't that amazing isn't that beautiful uh great hope you know the lord uh punishes but then he heals the Lord opens the wounds, but then He closes them. He puts balm in them. And that is a, a wonderful thing that we should have uh, great comfort in. And so uh, hopefully that, uh, that will comfort you tonight uh, as we look around us and we see a lot of despair. 
I was thinking this morning we were listening to um, the fact that uh, listening to the news and there was this individual who um, was the owner of uh, a restaurant chain I don't know if it was in New York or somewhere else but he had to close it because of course restaurants are now basically doing just carry out or uh, delivery uh, and he was talking about how uh, you know uh, he was blaming Trump for part of the fact that he um, he was uh, that he's not that he's Asian American he's Asian American but he was blaming Trump because Trump supposedly made a, a point of blaming the um, the Chinese for the for the virus and the fact that they were not forthcoming and so on and so forth and then he said that um, you know everybody has the right to be whoever they think they are and so I thought about that and we were uh, discussing it Ginger and I were discussing it and thinking about how that's so uh, emblematic of our society today you know you can be whoever you think you are uh, but in reality, we are who we, who we are, you know, who God has made us to be. And first and foremost, in the sight of God, we're sinners. And we need salvation. We need to come to Christ to be saved. We can't just think our way through things and think that because we think so, uh, that makes it so. Uh, and so it's important and it's essential for us to understand that reality, that we are who God says we are and not uh, any otherwise. Uh, and then um, there was a, uh, a segment on the Passover. As you know, Passover is celebrated this week. Uh, that's why Easter is on Sunday, because Easter and Passover in the Western uh, side of the church, anyway, uh, are tied together. And so uh, there was this, uh, it was about a five minute long uh, segment talking about Passover, and it was especially dealing with the fact that there was this family who always gets together for Passover, but this year, because of the social distancing and so so forth, they weren't going to be able to do that. They were going to have to do it virtually. Uh, and I, at the end of the, the segment, I, I commented to Ginger and I said, you know, it's very unfortunate that uh, five minutes talking about the Passover and not once is the name of God mentioned. Uh, and again, it's emblematic of our society, the fact that you can have something like the Passover and not talk about God. And I mean, God is the central figure of the Passover, for crying out loud. Without God, there is no Passover. And so how can you talk about the Passover and not talk about God? Uh, and yet they managed to do just that. Uh, again, lesson for us. Let's remember that uh, we are the people of God. And that as the people of God, we need to uh, ensure that we are about Him, that everything is about Him, that life is about Him, our, um, our health, our sickness, our life, our death, uh, everything is about Him. God is at the center of everything, not us. We are simply the beneficiaries of what He has done in Christ. And so it's, we do well to remember that today and always. Uh, so, there's a study for tonight. Hopefully, you find it beneficial. Uh, if you have any comments, please put them in the chat. I will try to answer them. There is a little delay between uh, me speaking and what's being broadcast. And so, if, um, you know, I'm, I'm going to stop talking so that I can look at the chat. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, bear that in mind. So, uh, please... Uh, if you have any questions, again, put them in the chat, and I will uh, do my best to answer them either now or we'll find the answer for you later. Uh, that's absolutely true. Somebody said in the chat that we are His creation, the Imago Dei, which is the image of God of only two genders, not fictional characters of our own making, and how true that is. Uh, unfortunately, you know, far too many people <laughs> think that way nowadays that, you know, we are sort of like, uh, you know, there's 600 genders or, or whatever it is today, uh, even in official documents that has become uh, doing those, those kinds of things, unfortunately. So, 
Uh, any questions from from anybody? Thank you. I see somebody enjoyed the study, and I I appreciate it. Uh, I'm glad that it's helpful uh, and that it's uh, beneficial. You know, that's the idea. Is hopefully so that we can all grow in grace and in knowledge, uh, and so. Um, the more we grow, the more we know of God, the more we, uh, we grow closer to Him, uh, the more we understand ourselves for who we really are, and the less likely we will be to, um, to deceive ourselves into thinking that we are uh, more than we ought to be. Paul told the Romans in Romans chapter 12, verse 3, that we are not to think of ourselves more highly than we ought to, but we are to think soberly uh, according to uh, the measure of faith that we have been given. And so it is important for us to understand that concept. Again, if you join me a little late, uh, hopefully sometime later this week or maybe early next, I'm going to try to work something so that we can all get on either, whether it's Google Hangouts or Jitsi or something, that we can do a, a live, um, uh, a live uh, streaming so we can all interact. Uh, and so I'll let you know via email when I hope to do that. Uh, somebody asked me my thoughts on the virus and the possible end time possibilities. Well, obviously the end times can come at any moment. And I think that that's one of the lessons that we need to learn from uh, the early church. The early church uh, was expecting the Lord's coming at any moment. And so we need to be prepared the same way. Whether the virus portends that uh, the coming or not is really not that important. I think the important thing is for us to understand that uh, we need to be prepared. Uh, whether it's today, whether it's 100 years from now, the Lord is going to come. Uh, that, is for, that is a certainty. Uh, and it may be that, well, the, the, um, the, the world will end now. You know, this may be the beginning of the end, as it were. But we have been in the last days since the time of the apostles, and so that hasn't changed any. So the, the moral of the story is, I think, we need to be prepared. Um, someone says that they're reading out of First Samuel when Saul becomes a king. Did the Holy Spirit stay on him, or how did that work? Um, the Holy Spirit came upon Saul. Remember, he prophesied a number of times, and so on and so forth. But in Second Samuel chapter 7, Beginning with verse 12, God is giving the promise to David of, uh, of uh, Solomon and then the Messiah coming to the throne and his throne being established forever. Uh, and there's something there that he says that's very interesting. And that is that uh, he, God speaking, he will not take his loving kindness away from uh, Solomon, you know, even though he's not mentioned by name, uh, like he did uh, from Saul whom he removed from before David. And so uh, the Spirit came upon Saul at times, but the Lord eventually removed that Spirit from Saul. And so uh, even though he was anointed to be king, we know that because of Saul's disobedience, the kingdom was taken away uh, from him eventually, obviously, but from his lineage. We know that his son Jonathan died also, and none from his lineage became king uh, after he died and you know the the kingdom line the kingdom lineage was transferred to David and so uh, that's uh, what the scripture talks about when it talks about the spirit uh, being upon Saul but then being removed because of disobedience okay hopefully that answered your question uh, if not let me know you know I'll try to class clarify a little more that was 2 Samuel chapter 7, uh, verses beginning with verse 12. Uh, again, if you want to look at that later on. Um, so, all right, well, um, it's been good. It's been useful for me, certainly. Uh, every time that we uh, study, you know, uh, a lot of times, the teacher is 
the one that benefits the most uh, often and so hopefully um, you know thankfully uh, I have the opportunity to do these these kind of things uh, thankfully we have that technology I mean imagine if this had happened 34 even 30 years ago uh, we wouldn't have had this opportunity we would have had to only do it uh, via audio and then uh, trying to get the cassettes to other people and so uh, it would have been uh, a little difficult obviously somebody mentions that we could use zoom to do a study and uh, certainly I can try that uh, I'm open to you know uh, to uh, suggestions uh, send me emails or uh, let me know what you think uh, would be useful and we'll try to do that uh, again we'll try it out sort of like in a different setting so that way hopefully we can work the bugs out and then when we come to the study we'll be able to do that and without uh, interruptions or uh, without the streaming being uh, interrupted or cut so all right well let's go ahead and close in a word of prayer uh, and we'll be dismissed our father and our God we thank you that you have seen fit to uh, give us another day give us another opportunity to uh, to study your word to learn more from you Lord to know about your loving kindness to learn about your loving kindness to remind ourselves of that we're reminded of that every day when we open our eyes uh, when we have food to eat clothes to wear a home to shelter us from the uh, environment uh, and and yet all too often we forget and so we have to be reminded time and time again about how good you are how uh, loving and how kind Lord and so thank you for reminding us of that thank you for all the ones that had the opportunity to be uh, online tonight and for all of those who will be able to watch later on uh, we pray that you will bless them and that you keep them and that you uh, help us all to be more committed to you to learn more about you to love you more father increase our faith especially in these difficult times when there's a lot of fear around us help us to be courageous uh, and to trust in you so that we can be an example to others of, of that courage and of that hope and that I trust Lord and that we can be conduit to be able to give others uh, the knowledge of that trust that is placed in you and you alone who alone can deliver and we pray all these things in christ our savior's name amen thank you all and good night